the way of Will John. Guys, welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today, Jim Afromo. Thank you, sir, for being here. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Will. Yeah, of course. Um, it's been an interesting day. Um, and we will get into mentality and mindset. So many of you know that I'm in Croatia at the moment in Zagreb, and we just had uh, the second of, uh, we've had two earthquakes in 24 hours, basically. So yesterday was a 5.2. Today was a 6.3 or 4, something around there. Crazy for a guy from Kansas. We don't have earthquakes. We have tornadoes. Those are much more manageable. We know when they're coming (laughs) and I know when they're done. And this has been, you know, really interesting, but, um, happy to have you here, honestly. And, uh, I was turned on to you by, uh, the book champion and it has a little extra, what's the full title. Could you give us a full title here? Absolutely. It's the champion's mind, how great athletes think, try, uh, think, train and thrive. Yeah. 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 So really cool. This type of stuff has always, you know, fascinated me. So we should just get straight into it. I know all of the guys, they probably, uh, the comments will be very interesting and uh, you'll definitely be a guest that I know that they're going to want to have back on. So why don't you tell us why you did this, how you have the expertise in this and uh, we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Uh, So uh, growing up, I didn't know much about the mental game because there was not a lot of information on it, but I played a variety of sports. Um, And when I would ask people like, Hey, when you're in a slump, what do you do? No one seemed to have a great answer or I get nervous before I compete, you know, what should I do? And nothing seemed to help. And so I became more and more fascinated with the topic of psychology and sports psychology and um, ended up going to uh, undergrad at University of Oregon, studied psychology, and then graduate school at Michigan State and studied psychology and counseling as well. And um, then I worked at Arizona State University in intercollegiate athletics for about a decade. And I started giving handouts on, you know, different mental game topics. And a lot of the student athletes would say, hey, this is really helpful. What else do you got? And so I thought, well, maybe I could put a lot of these handouts into a book so that they could throw it in their bag, take it with them on a trip, you know, read when you got a few minutes before maybe, let's say, practice or at night before you go to bed. And so that's kind of the genesis of the book. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All stuff that's practical. So, yeah, you basically solved issues that people are are are, are dealing with all the time, all athletes and even people outside of sports. Um which is one of the first things that I kind of want to get into. And it's a question that we get all the time on the channel because guys do get nervous before games, not even just at games, just when they're playing too. It happens to people all the time. And anxiety is a huge thing across a lot of young players in the culture. So a question that I'll throw to you and I have, I'm curious about the acronym BEST um, as well that I, I'm sure we'll get into. But just as a first um, thing we got, I asked the guys to, to throw us some questions on, uh, Instagram mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I'm kind of, I've got some summarized and by and large anxiety was one of the things that people wanted to know. So just straight off the bat with all of the people you, you've talked to, studied, kind of looked at how do athletes, if you could give us the best step-by-step basis, what do I do? I'm nervous before the game. What now? Yeah. I, I think number one is, uh, be glad you're nervous. Um, I've actually had in all my years of working with elite athletes and top professionals in other, you know, achievement domains, you know, musicians and actors. um, I've only had one person ever tell me that they don't get anxious before they perform. And this was a veteran musician. And he actually said to me, I wish I still got nervous. He said, I've been doing this for so long. I wish I had that, you know, those butterflies in the belly because Butterflies are good for us. Um, It sharpens, they sharpen our senses. Uh, They keep us on our toes. And what I didn't understand when I was growing up playing, you know, a variety of sports is that that's how your body prepares itself to perform. So if you're feeling some, you know, nervous energy the night before, you know, obviously the morning of and right before game time, um, your body is working well, (laughs) your body is working properly. And what we tend to do is we tend to psych ourselves out and intimidate ourselves by thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this means something's wrong rather than, hey, this means something's right. And so first and foremost, embrace the nerves, um, enjoy the butterflies, 
Um, it's just a blast to play. And without those butterflies, not only would we not play well or perform well, um, we wouldn't, we wouldn't enjoy it because, you know, that's the rush of competition. So first and foremost, uh, butterflies are good guys. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, that, oh, did you want to keep going? Oh, well, you know, I'd add to that. Uh, the second thing is when we're feeling a little bit nervous, we get, a, you know, it's really important to be mindful of our self-talk, um, as I was alluding to just a moment ago, because we tend to say, uh-oh, you know, why am I nervous? No one else seems nervous. What's wrong with me? Does this mean something bad's going to happen? And again, that's where we need to talk sense to ourselves. And that's where we need to say, hey, look, uh, I'm pumped. I'm jazzed. I'm ready. You know, we're vibing right now. Let's go. And so talk to yourself in a way that helps yourself. And then the second thing is, you know, deep breathing. When we're feeling a little anxious, we're feeling a little nervous. The tendency is to hold our breath. And so take big, deep breaths and really exaggerate the exhale. That's key. Wow. Okay. So that's going to get us on to a whole nother uh, tangent right there. But I think that's 100% True and obvious. I mean, there are games, I've had both. I've had both games that I've played in where I feel as if I have a whole bunch of nerves and I'm thinking, why is this so, you know, you've done this. How many soccer games have I played in my lifetime? It's, what is this? And then other times when I haven't had any nerves and I was okay with that, it, it really, it fluctuates throughout the season, I would say, at least on my, you know, the stance, uh, the, but it is nice to have. And I think the ability to direct that energy is what I've gained as I've gotten older. You know, it was just this, this hazard. This my mind is just like, what is this? You know, and as you grow into it, you start to direct that energy, and you kind of understand your emotions better, and that's what gives you something. You know, to to succeed. You know, a bit a bit better. But okay, uh, I mean, that's obviously. <laughs> The first thing on everybody's mind, you talked about breathing and we might as well go on that tangent. James Nestor is uh, a guy who is going to come on uh, the podcast a little later. He wrote a book called Breathe. I believe it's called Breathe um, and has some really interesting things on it. So uh, it's kind of a two-part question with this deep breathing. If I can try to give these guys, everybody who's listening, an actual guide on how to do this, is there... Do you have a formula? Is it 10 deep breaths? Do you think someone should do this before every game? Can I do it during the game? Like, do you have anything? Have you found anything that would help in that sense? Yeah, that's a great question because there's so many great breathing techniques out there. And so the key is to practice all of them and find one that really works for you. And as you alluded to just a moment ago, you know, things fluctuate during a season. So you might find that, hey, this breathing technique really helped, uh, you know, for a few games. And now I tried something different and it also keeps it fresh, too. But uh, one that I really like is Navy SEAL breathing, which is, you know, it's, it's also called box breathing. And so you breathe. I've never heard of this. Oh, okay. So what you do is you breathe in for four. So inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four, and then repeat for as long as you want. And it could be a minute or two okay. or a little bit longer. And that's really powerful. And if the Navy SEALs use it, it's probably, you know, they're not going to waste their time, you know, if it's not helpful. Yeah. So that's a great one to start. But I think in the moment, you know, when you're on the field, I think the key sometimes is just to exaggerate the exhale or just to take, because that's really the relaxation response. The inhale is the stressful part, but most of us think of deep breathing as the inhale. It's really the exaggerate the exhale. And then, you know, maybe given the situation, just take an extra deep breath. So uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to overdo it, but sometimes just taking that extra deep breath or exaggerating the exhale can make all the difference during competition. Wow. That is, yeah, uh, huge. Um, especially considering that they're going to do all of, all the things that the Navy SEALs do. Yes, if they're able to do that and that's just a little tool that they have, you know it's useful. I have been... I do pranayama. Uh, every once in a pranayama is not a, necessarily the biggest staple in my breathing um, techniques. I've been doing these for probably, I've known about it for some, somewhere around seven years or so uh, that I first got turned on to, to that sort of stuff. And it's incredibly useful. The, the, the peace of mind that you get from 
taking control of your breath when it is, like you said, something where you get shallow breathing when you're when you're nervous and stuff like this. I think it's something that's understated in that I found at least the effect that it can have on you because a lot of people, myself included, growing up, you're looking for this key thing to put into your training. You know, the mind in ten years ago or fifteen, you know, say when I started my career. I don't remember anyone talking to me about it at all. Um, no one said anything about breathing or the mind, and it, it's changed, you know, dramatically. But um, I guess I want to kind of move from the breath into the mind aspect of things. I know, and since I haven't read your entire book, I'm sure there must be some sort of mention of the actual mental training aspect of things, and that generally meditation seems to be one of the leading things for, for most people. Did you, are you an advocate of meditation? Do you have a different mental way for guys to go about it or how have you approached that? Yeah, there's uh, so many great different meditation techniques. Uh, personally, I like it. Uh, when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have stuck with it. Uh, but now that I've practiced it enough, I, I really like it because what it does is it just like you were saying, it just kind of clears the mind. Um, and the clearer the mind, the more powerful the body. And I love the ancient samurai warriors. So talk about, you know, we talked about the Navy SEALs. Think about the ancient samurai warriors were big on meditation. And if you're going into a sword fight, you want to clear your head. <laughs> you know, you want to, you know, you don't want anything on your mind. And uh, they would talk about it as the mind is like a diamond. And just throughout our day, you know, it's kind of like mud or dirt or whatever gets on the diamond. And, you know, focusing on your breath and doing some meditation is just a way to kind of clear the diamond, you know, clean the diamond um, so that you are available mentally, you're 100% present and available for whatever comes next. And if you're distracted during a sword fight, lots of luck, you know, you're not going to do too well. And the same <laughs> yeah, on the pitch. Yeah. Well, uh, I've noticed, yeah, in myself, uh, for sure, with all the things that I do, I have a lot of extracurricular activities and things that I like to get into. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in those. And I think one of the trappings for a lot of people and uh, is that it's hard in the moment when everything is going to think that you need to A, take a breath or B, that you need to just meditate, that you just need to sit there. And it's only normally once you're a minute, three minutes, 10 minutes into the meditation that you realize, I should have done this earlier, that I, I should have, you know, I should have stopped to do this because it is that powerful. And uh, I don't know what you've found in other people. How many of the people that you interview talk to and how many of them have this sort of practice? Who, Who's doing this? Are all the elites, Well, the elite athletes doing this? Yeah. I mean, I, I like to say the mental game is the last frontier in sports. And, you know, pretty much now everyone is, you know, pretty good at strength and conditioning. Um, everyone's pretty good in terms of understanding, you know, uh, eating clean. Uh, and everyone understands rest and recovery is important. Uh, but in terms of the mental game, a lot of athletes still at the highest level, uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily have a world-class game plan. And as you know, at the highest levels, it's all about consistency. So if uh, we don't have a consistent mental game plan, you know, again, lots of luck, we're going to be inconsistent in our performance because the mind leads the body. And if your head isn't prepared, your body's not going to be prepared. And, but what I would say is in terms of at least, you know, meditation is one of the, you know, kind of the key mental game skills. Uh, I would say about half the athletes I work with at, uh, you know, college, pro level, Olympic level, uh, love meditation. The other half, they're just not going to do it and it doesn't work for them. And that's okay. <laughs> Because right. there's other things that they can do or that works better for them. So mm -hmm. the key is to have a, a like an inner toolbox with all these power tools in there. And so meditation, they might prefer the Navy SEAL breathing. They might prefer, you know, taking 10 breaths and just trying to be more mindful on each breath and, you know, count the breath on each ex exhalation. Uh, they might do other things like listen to music that gets them in the right frame of mind. So there's a variety of things that you can do as an athlete, but meditation is really important because we have about 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. 
And so our head is just filled with all this noise. And a lot of those thoughts, I think about 70 to 80% of those thoughts are negative. And so just giving the brain, the mind a chance just to clean itself, clear itself, uh, just feels good. Feels really good. It's like a timeout for your, uh, for your thinking. It is, it is everything. It really is. It's, it's, it's so underutilized and, um, What's amazing, it's, it seems to have this exponential growth factor in is this, if you continue to put this on, if you continue to polish the diamond, as you're saying, it just keeps sparkling. Like it just keeps getting better and better. At least that's what I found. And that seems to be from everyone's anecdotal evidence, that's what's happening. I, I'm curious what you found in the, the top performers on visualization, though. Uh, this preparation before the game, you know, and I even want to touch on, uh, we do a lot of work with a company called mind sport, which is, uh, also an app. And we definitely got to get into your app. Cause I'm curious what you're, uh, mm-hmm. what you're doing there, but on the visualization aspect, the prep and all of the evidence we have now for how the brain doesn't even understand that it's not real, you know, uh, what it's doing or what's being visualized. What have you found? What would you suggest for a guy that wants to try and take himself from where he is to where he really wants to be, you know, what sort of training regimen in the brain should he get a, him or herself up to? Oh, love it. Uh, visualization is, uh, is a game changer. And the key with visualization is um, it's just like any skill, you need to practice it. And so I remember one NBA player that I worked with a few years ago, he said, you know, tell me about visualization. You know, I picture myself, you know, making the game winning shot, but what's more, you know, what else? And one of the things that we talked about is just spending a few minutes before each game, seeing yourself as the player you want to be and playing the way you want to play. And then maybe go over a couple, two or three, you know, different scenarios that might happen in the game. And then how do you want to respond like a champion? if you're faced with those situations. And so, you know, it could be, you know, you missed your first two or three shots. What are you thinking on your, you know, on the next shot? And, uh, and so being prepared for that is everything, you know, it's huge. And uh, so it's not just picturing winning, it's picturing the steps that lead to winning and uh, dealing with adversity that might come up and how you're going to handle it. Um, Great anecdote from one of the PGA tour players that I work with, uh, He's uh, he's one on the PJ Tour, uh, uh, you know, a solid, you know, veteran golfer. And he told me what he does is every tournament round, what he'll do, you know, he's staying at a hotel. He'll fill up the bathtub with warm water, put some Epsom salt in there. He's a little bit of of an older guy. And (laughs) he'll play all 18 holes in his mind before he goes out on the course. And so he's just sitting there soaking in the tub and just picturing, okay, first hole, first shot you know, hits it on the fairway, then hits it on the green, sinks the putt. Okay. What's the next hole. And he's played these courses so many times that, you know, he's able to kind of see exactly what he's going to expect out there. And he said to, for him, that made all the difference between him being a good player versus a really, really, really good player. Visualization is fun too. A lot of times um, we kind of do it spontaneously. We might, you know, like kind of like, you know, more daydreaming, but uh, we want to make it a little bit more consistent and then have a plan when we do it. So, OK, what am I going to visualize today? You know, it might be, hey, I'm going up against a tough opponent. Let's see myself, you know, making my moves and, you know, and playing well and uh, and loving the challenge. And again, when you're in that situation, it's almost like, man, it feels like I've been here before. And it's such a good feeling because it's like I know what to do. Uh, one more quick thing on visualization. Uh, I love the story of Andre Agassi, the famous tennis player. He said when he first won Wimbledon, he said it took him literally like five, 10 seconds to realize that it actually happened because he had won Wimbledon so many times in his mind for a brief moment. He wasn't sure if it was real or not when he actually did win it. So yeah, a lot of the athletes I work with, um, you know, that spend just a little extra time. It doesn't have to be a huge block of time. It could be five minutes here, 10 minutes there, you know, but just more on an everyday or every other day basis. Um, it's free, it's free training. It's great training. And it doesn't put any stress or strain on the body. Have you noticed when these guys are, are visualize, visualizing if what it is specifically that they put their 
attention on because I've seen, and I, I've had other people who've done some really great uh, studies and that have taken this seriously, at least the, the general sense that I'm getting from asking people like you that are experts in this, in this field is that they tend to focus a lot, A, not just on the picture, but on also the feeling of what it feels like to win, to have beaten the guy, to have got a hole in one or whatever it is that their, their goal is. And so uh, I think it's worth saying to all the people that, are, that maybe don't visualize actively in, with concentration to know what should I really be picturing? How should I feel? Should I feel this? Should I, do I need to go as detailed as feeling the wind or, or the sun or uh, hear the crowd? How, uh, what are they focusing on when, you know, when he gets in the, in the tub to really make it work, let's say? Yeah, well, you definitely want to use all your senses like you talked about. So you want to see it, you want to feel it, you want to hear it, you want to smell it. You know, if you're a swimmer, you want to smell that chlorine. Um, you want to feel the water on your body, you know, and... But the more you do it, the better at it you get. So the more you practice it, I, I like to uh, refer to it as like, you know, like playing a video game. The more you play it, the better at it you get. So I've had a lot of athletes that have said, you know, I don't really see anything and it's hard to feel what I'm doing. And I'll just say, hey, just stick with it. Let's see what happens. And, uh, you know, just to use that basketball player as an example, when he first started visualizing himself dribbling the basketball, he said, you know, it would stick to the floor in the, the basket in his imagination. And he said, you know, right. but after a little bit of practice, he said, you know, man, I could see myself doing everything. And wow. uh, but I would say the two most important senses are trying to see yourself perform well and then try to feel it in your body. And um, some athletes are better at one than the other. And that's OK. I've had a lot of athletes say, you know, I really don't see anything, but I could feel it in my body. And it's like, hey, just keep doing that. Does it seem to help? And they're like, yeah, this seems to help a lot. So uh, you don't need to force anything with visualization, but you might surprise yourself because I've had a lot of people say, you know, I'm just not good at it. But then if they put in the work, they find out, you know what, I am good at it. I just didn't do the work. It's been one of the keys that I've found uh, that for some of the people that I've also mentioned that they should visualize. And for me, I can remember distinctly also a game years ago that I, for whatever reason, as the bus, it was an away game and we we're going to, I guess I, I kind of know why the nerves, this stadium, uh, they're notorious for being crazy. It's a, you know, and it's full. It's almost, it's always full. It doesn't matter what. And, uh, they're also, their fans are just insane. There's racial abuse at this stadium. Like it's just kind of one of these hostile environment type of places. And I can remember actually in the bus deciding that it would be a good game. And I, I say that there was a decision. It was a decision. It was a visualization because I had music on. I always, my, my nickname when I was playing for the Chicago Fire was radio. I had these big headphones before it was cool to have them. And they just, you know, I, I've always kind of centered myself like that. But the visualization aspect of it is kind of what kills anxiety as well, I think, because like a lot of these guys are saying, you feel like you're there already and you're not you're not nervous if you have to pick up a glass of water and drink it because you've done it a million times. You're not going to have any problem doing that. And so that's what I think visualization gives to everyone, you know, in that in that sense a, a, a feeling of familiarity exactly. with what is going on. You know, uh, do you have any of the guys that are elite athletes along with their, their lives and everything. Do people extend this out? Have you found guys that talk about how they do this to create, I don't know, a better life, a better, a home, or is anyone, or is everybody just focusing? Because for instance, we have a, a goalkeeper uh, in our company, Tyler Back, who definitely visualizes. And he actually says that he visualizes in the shower. Like it's like, it's relaxing. It's calm. There's nobody there. He thinks about the game. He's a, you know, a goalkeeper. How did I do this and that? but he doesn't extend it out to the rest of his life. Um, do you have guys that are doing that are like, this is how I plan my college trip or whatever, you know, Absol how's that? Absolutely. Visualization is just a skill that we should all learn and use. And it's something that could help us in all areas of life. So just for example, to use myself, um, uh, just as an anecdote, um, uh, when I was writing the champion's mind, I'm not, a you know, uh, I'm, I'm not a writer by trade, you know, I'm a sports psychologist and a licensed counselor. And so writing doesn't come naturally to me. And it's not necessarily something that I'm good at, I just work hard at it. Uh, but what really helped me during the process of working on my first book was visualizing myself holding the final product. 
And that gave me a lot of motivation and, uh, you know, to sit down at the desk and write. And so uh, you could imagine how good it's going to feel when you accomplish whatever you want to accomplish in life. So it could be a student uh, at a university and might picture, you know what, I have the diploma in my hand, you know, and um, use that as motivation to work hard and to study hard each day in, in class. And um, so we could use it for motivation. We could use it for confidence. It could be just picturing ourselves, you know, like, okay, go back in your mind to one of your best games ever, or maybe one of your best days ever. And, uh, you know, see yourself kind of get that feeling in your body. And then it's like, okay, how can re- I re- recreate that today? So there's a lot of purposes, confidence, motivation, you know, and then what you talked about comfort level, it's really important to feel like, you know, I've been there, I've done this, I can do it again. You know, I've been there a million times in my head. That, yeah, has done, it, it, it definitely changed. And I think it's kind of something, my dad is the one who uh, kind of pushed that on to, uh, to me. He didn't even, it wasn't a forced thing. It was a nice, gentle guide towards it. And then kind of once you take it on, I mean, there's nothing better than picturing something, especially like you having, I mean, I, I know a lot of work goes into writing uh, a book, like, and you're not comfortable in doing that. So that is just that that ability to do that to, to stretch from zero from non nonsense to nothing to you know the end is what is is everything there i'm i would i would actually want to shift just a little bit uh before we'll come back to it here in a second but you mentioned we more or less know how to do strength and conditioning you know we more or less know how to eat clean but nutrition is also still still a thing what what have you found there is there a link because I've played on many teams and in many different countries, and I have seen guys that eat ridiculously bad and guys that um, will eat, you know, only a leaf before they get, you know, it's all over the place. It's just, I, I, I would say it is important, obviously, to know your body and to know what you, uh, uh, to know yourself. I mean, not everybody is the same, but what did you find? Is there something that is a core piece of things within these athletes or... Yeah. Well, I, I've definitely seen a lot of athletes that like their comfort food. And so, uh, you know, just an example, uh, a few years ago, the uh, Golden State Warriors, uh, after on the plane, after a road trip, you know, on the way back home after a game, they would love their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And so the sports scientists and, the you know, their sports nutritionists said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we could probably, you know, get better fuel and, re- you know, and, and recovery food for you after the game. And so they took away the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And Steph Curry and some of the other guys said, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. We love our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And they went back to that. And uh, ended up winning the championship that year. But uh, the key here is that there's a big psychological component to nutrition. And so, for example, uh, when I was working with one particular pro team, um, they would love to go to like, you know, a restaurant afterwards, uh, some of the guys and just kind of talk about the game afterward. And, you know, and kind of, it was a bonding thing. And the sports nutritionist said, hey, why are you guys doing that? We have better food for you here. And so they, it was discouraged for them to go out and have dinner together and do all that because they would make some poor choices. But when they stopped doing that, they stopped playing as well and stopped feeling like, you know, they were on the same page with each other. So that's where you got to balance, you know, this might be good for me physiologically, but is it good for me mentally? And so that's the balance there. Um, if you make it too strict where you don't enjoy what you're eating, you know, that's the challenge. Um, then no one wins, no matter how good it is for you. Totally. Yeah. That strict, uh, approach to things is probably not the best. I do eat really clean. I enjoy, I mean, part of the, and that's me and that's me knowing me after all these years, I love the fact I love feeling healthy. I don't like how I feel after eating a whole bag of candy, you know, it may feel good a little at first and then you have some regret. It doesn't really, you know, so over the, over the course of years, I found that I enjoy eating clean for the most part, my veggies and rice and meat and all that stuff. And it's really, it's definitely benefited me, um, you know, in my career. But, uh, besides food, I think I'm curious personally on sleep, 
Did you find that anybody, because that's another thing that people can kind of forego the food and the, and, and I think it's also one of those things where it's a, it's a cumulative effect. And it's like, you might be able to go without sleep for a while. You might also be able to go without some good food for a very long time in the young parts of your career, just thinking of this, but will that catch you? Uh, you know, how are these guys dealing with sleep in that sense? Yeah. Sleep is definitely a superpower. And it's one of those things that, you know, any smart athlete will take seriously. And just like food, it might change during the course of your career. So some guys might be able to, I know Kobe Bryant, when he scored 81 points against Toronto, you know, years ago, he had before the game, he had pizza and uh, grape soda. And so, but he realized, you know what, as I progress in my career, I can't keep doing that. And the same thing is with sleep and recovery. Um, So, yeah, that's definitely something that, you know, uh, I, I like to joke around with athletes. Don't be lazy with your sleep. <laughs> you know, don't be lazy with your recovery. Right. You know, take it seriously. Now, most of us think that we're getting deep rest and relaxation when we're watching TV or hanging out. And you got to go deeper than that. So that's where relaxation strategies and, you know, sleep audios and all those good things can really help to shut off your brain, turn off your body and, you know, really get deep rest and recovery. Um, so that you're at full power the next day. Um, but yeah, sleep is something that, um, a lot of times it is hard to shut off the mind at night. So that goes back to what we talked about with some of the breathing techniques and meditation as well. Have you, have you found, um, if you could 80, 20, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm, I'm just too curious. Are you aware of the 80, 20 principle? Yes. If you could 80, 20, some of the things that you've gotten from these, these uh, characters, I'm going to call them all these guys from music to all the, is there something that, is there a thing that binds them all that you can kind of see that if someone is a young guy right now, listening to this can be like, all right, well, maybe that that's a centerpiece. If I can focus on that, you know, all these people share that characteristic. Is there something like that? Or have you not found that? Well, I I would say a lot of times when I've started consulting with the team, I would ask a coach or, you know, uh, one of the staff members, you know, what's this guy's deal or, you know, what have you observed about this guy? And a lot of times I hear the word predator. And so uh, a lot of them, a lot of the best athletes that I've worked with have that predator mentality, which is I'm going to kick your butt. Uh, You know, I'm going to kick your butt. And (laughs) And I'm going to have fun doing it. And so they love to compete. They love to hunt. You know, they love to attack. Um, They love tough competition. And, uh, you know, it's always against, you know, like, I just love my chances against you. And so I think that's a big thing is that they approach the sport to make something happen. They step on the field. I'm here to make something happen. I think when we get more in prey mode, It's that when we're feeling like I don't want to screw up, I don't want to let my teammates down. I don't want to, you know, mess up and, you know, it's going to, you know, it's going to be a major catastrophe if I do. Um, That's how we get in our own way. And so a lot of, I think, you know, the mental skills and strategies, self-talk, visualization, you know, good body language, sleep, rest, recovery, um, you know, eating, eating like a champion. I think a lot of that is just get us into that mode of, you know, I'm here to make something happen. Uh, let's make something huge happen today. And then, you know, no one's going to have more fun doing it than us. Uh, I think another big thing is optimism. A lot of the athletes I've worked with at the highest level, uh, they just have this sense, this feeling that something good is about to happen. And, uh, one of my favorite stories Uh, I worked for the San Francisco Giants. I was the peak performance coordinator for three years. And one of the players on the big league club, uh, if he would strike out, let's say his first at bat, he's thinking, you know, he'd come in the dugout and say, man, I cannot wait to get this guy my next at bat. You know, the pitcher, I'm going to beat him next time. Now, anyone could do that. But if he struck out that time, he would think the same thing and say the same thing, the third at bat and then the fourth at bat. And so he was actually getting more and more dangerous as the game went on because he was just, man, I'm due for a hit now. I can't wait to go up to bat where, you know, maybe most of us would think, you know, today's not my day. You know, this is embarrassing. 
Uh, what's wrong with my swing? You know, he was just like, man, I'm due. Let's go. So he was optimistic that, you know, if I'm there, if I put myself in that position enough times, I eventually will come through in the clutch. So that's important for all of us is, you know, I don't see a lot of champions that are pessimists. <laughs> you know, most of them are optimists, you know, that, hey, something's going to work out. It might not go exactly the way we want, but, you know, eventually we're going to come out on top. I, I think that predator mentality. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, I just wanted to go back real quick to to the sleep deal. Uh, uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, you know, I can't sleep the night before, you know, I compete, uh, you know, it's the Olympics, it's, you know, my first marathon, you know, maybe it's playoff day, you know, I can't sleep the night before. And one of my favorite examples, that's a new example, is uh, Mike Tyson recently fought Roy Jones Jr., uh, in an exhibition match. And uh, it was great. Afterward, uh, Mike Tyson was asked, you know, what did you think when you woke up the morning of the fight, you know, earlier that day? What were you thinking when you woke up? You know, you hadn't fought, you know, a, a pro fight in years and years and years and years. What were you thinking? And Mike Tyson smiled at the at the question. And he said, I didn't sleep the night before. He said, I'm one of those scary guys that waits, you know, that that's up all night and can't wait to go out there and do what I do. And so I really got a big kick out of that because it was kind of like, you know, taking a situation that most of us freak out about, like, oh my God, you know, I need my sleep the night before. He's thinking, I'm one of those scary guys that doesn't need to sleep the night before because I'm out there, you know, I'm in the dark waiting, you know, for my chance. And you know, but it's a reminder that, you know, get your sleep and rest leading up to the event, but don't stress out about the night before. That's, that's gotta be huge. I mean, talk about a guy with a predator mindset. I mean, there's probably never been anybody, you know, <laughs> with that. And I've, I've noticed that I see that and you generally in, in, in football or soccer, you, you generally find that in strikers a whole lot more because it, it's so well bent up on goals. You, you, you know, there's on the one hand, they can look at it from a pessimistic point of if you don't score, you don't play. And the other guys are also thinking, the optimists are thinking, if I don't score, I don't get to celebrate. I don't get to have fun. I don't, you know, my name's not on the score sheet and we don't win and all that other. So there's this, this point. And, and it is interesting because there's that whole uh, humans, and at least from what I've read, and this is awesome because you're a psychologist, you'll be able to tell me, at least I feel as if I've read that humans, generally speaking, when given two choices, will tend to do the thing. They'll tend to prevent pain and prevent loss rather than jumping for the thing that they, they might get. I mean, obviously, it's going gonna, it's gonna to differ from person to person. But if in, in, in my sport, at least specifically, uh, I do notice that there are guys, the strikers, by and large, and I play with some great ones, truly, truly great national team players and, and, and great for their country and stuff like that. The ones that do, they take more shots than everyone. They, they take more chances than everyone. There are guys that would be in the same exact position and something in their brain tells them, hey, you might not take that shot. Whereas in their heads, they'll take this crazy shot and a whole lot of times it goes in. It'll deflect. It'll do something that may not have been the prettiest or whatever. But the fact that they've given themselves that chance somehow makes them, you know, uh, a winner. And I don't know if you found that same thing within the the athletes or uh, anyone in general, but did these guys do that within separate parts of their life? I mean, there's stories of Michael Jordan and even outside of the sport, uh, possibly being excessive gambling, whatever it is, but it's because of the mindset also where it can be twofold, you know, obsessive about the win, also believing that they can't lose. Uh, uh, does it cross that line sometimes or where are you, uh, have you seen that when, with, with people or? That's such a great question because what, can help you on the field doesn't always help you off the field. And uh, because when I work with athletes, a lot of it is when you step on the field, you better think that you're, you know, bigger and better than anyone out there and, you know, be loud and proud. And, you know, and, and, you know, again, it's, it's uh, I'm here to make something big happen. And you, so you run toward the pressure, you, you know, I want the last second shot. I want, you know, I want to come from behind. I want to, you know, if we're up by five goals, I want to be up by six goals. Like you're trying to make something happen. Uh, and you feel almost, you know, you want to feel almost invincible. Uh, like, Hey man, these guys are lucky to be playing with me today. You know, I feel that good, you know, and I almost feel sorry for the competition, you know, almost not quite. Uh, but you want to definitely have that predator mindset. 
um, that uh, I'm a champion, you know, and I could live with whatever happens. And I'm only thinking about, you know, what I want to have happen. And that's, you know, you brought up Michael Jordan. I love during the last dance, the recent documentary about the Bulls, you know, back in the day, their final run. And he was asked one time, you know, do you think about, you know, like the consequences of missing a game winning shot? And he said, why would I ever think about missing a shot I haven't taken yet? You know, he's like, it didn't even cross his mind. But what I found is champions are willing to, uh, uh, you know, dare greatly, achieve greatly. You know, they're willing to, you know, to be the hero, but they're also willing to, you know what, put it all on my shoulders. If I miss a game winning shot, I could live with it. I could handle it. I could deal with it. You know, I'll sleep on the street. You know, I don't care. I just want to be in that situation where I have a chance and opportunity. And so they love the pressure. It's like an energy bar for them. And uh, because they can handle whatever happens, if they make it, you know, hey, you know, that's what I do. That's who I am. If they don't make it, oh, man, I can't wait to be in that situation again because I know next time I'll make it. That's where the optimism comes in. Uh, But off the field, I think it's important to realize you're not bigger, better, more important than anyone else. Uh, And that some of that risk-taking behavior, you might need to tone down a little bit. And so that could be with the gambling, that could be with some other areas of life where you feel, you know, on the field, you want to feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You don't want to feel that way walking around, you know, during your day, because number one, you're going to turn off a lot of people. And number two, Um, you're going to probably do some risky, dumb things. And so I love the saying, you know, uh, be humble enough to prepare. So off the field, humility, you know, be humble enough to prepare, to get to know your teammates, to have a growth mindset, to learn from other people, to be a good person. But then when it's time to compete, be confident enough to perform. Right. I think one of the big issues for people, and I, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong in in saying this, but I think generally speaking, when you don't run towards the pressure or run at the problem, it just gets bigger. It just it it, it will show up in the next game. You'll think that oh maybe I'm over it, like it's fine, it's fine. But you didn't deal with anything. You have not yet run towards it. And once you can learn to enjoy that pressure with all these champions, thinking. I can handle this. I'm going to handle this. And not only that, I'm going to search for more areas within the game, within the sport that I can achieve and be more. And better. it just starts to be this snowball effect happens. And those guys start it. The game becomes going downhill where everybody's trying to push uphill where you're, if you're uh, scared, you know, of that, of that pressure. So I, I want to go back. Cause I don't think we actually answered. We mentioned it, the acronym best. I don't know if you define that. I don't know if it'd still be necessary to define that uh, where um, it's a, a tool necessarily that you say that champions kind of have this. Could you kind of explain that or am I, am well, I messing that up? Yeah, I use an acronym uh, in, in the champion's mind book. And, uh, but basically, it's just about body language and it's about putting your best foot forward. And so body language is, uh, is key because... If your body language is down, uh, what are you telling the other team? You're telling the other team, beat me now. And if you're and you're also telling your teammates, I, you know, uh, you're on your own because, <laughs> you know, you can't necessarily depend on me today. So body language is is huge. And uh, and, you know, what message are you sending to others and what message are you sending to yourself? And so what I always like to say to athletes is always, you know, if I were to come and watch you play, I should always think you're the best guy on the field, you know, the best having your best game just by how you look out there. You know, you're, you know, great energy, great effort, great attitude, chin up, chest out, um, you know, the eye of the tiger, all that stuff. So um, that's important. A lot of times we minimize that. But if I'm playing against someone and their body language is down, uh, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it because I know I got in their head or I know that I broke their spirit. And so if your body language is up, what you're basically telling the other team is it doesn't matter if you beat me today or not, you didn't break my spirit and I'm going to beat you next time. You know, like you want to be someone that no one wants to compete against because it's like, man, this guy brings it every time. 
we had on the the podcast a little while ago um ed and i cannot remember his last name he's going to kill me but uh he 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 wrote a brilliant brilliant book and what he'd done is he had actually studied uh some nfl guys he is a journalist by nature um which is with a curiosity of kind of some of the more interesting and almost to a certain extent, almost esoteric things that would happen in sports where guys don't really understand how they've made this shot. They don't feel like it, you know, and I, 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 re- I recounted to him one thing that had happened to me uh, in one of the goals that I scored. But I remember that he had studied uh, Pete Carroll and some of the, the interesting things that Pete thinks and, and on mindset and, you know, uh, it's a very different approach. And obviously in the NFL, when you have to show a sort of toughness and sort of thing. He has a, a more encompassing laid back sort of style. And if, I haven't read Phil Jackson's book, but from what I understand, he's very of the same vein, kind of with a good, good understanding of this. Did you, or have you, I, I definitely have to ask any crazy stories from anybody of things that they can't understand, or have you noticed, have there been, is there any story that peeks out your, your brain that you've heard or that people you've worked with that they don't really understand. I mean, the guy sitting in a, a tub going through the entire thing is one, but I guess he's kind of figured out that that works, you know? Yeah. Uh, everyone has their own quirks and, you know, their own way of doing things. Um, and so the key is to experiment with different, you know, approaches and find out what works best for you. But, uh, you know, authenticity is a word that's, that uh, is important. Mm-hmm. It's an important word because I would say, you know, Pete Carroll is off, you know, he, he He's he's Pete Carroll. He's himself. He's not trying to be someone he's not. Same with Phil Jackson. So I think athletes really love a leader, a coach uh, that is comfortable in their own skin, that um, is competent at what they do, but kind of has, you know, their own unique style uh, that's true to them. Um, I've also found a lot of these coaches are really good at getting to know their players. I think a lot of times coaches make the mistake of getting too caught up in X's and O's and thinking about their players. Like I'll plug this guy in here or I'll plug that guy in there versus who is this guy? Do I even know him? And, you know, I love the story of, uh, you know, Steve Kerr, when he got his, you know, his job as the head coach for Golden State Warriors, he actually went to Pete Carroll and tried to learn a lot from him in terms of how he really, yeah. And uh, one of the things Pete said is get to know your players. And so before PD or before uh, Steve Kerr even really started with Golden State, he would, he called up and, you know, and, and would go visit all of his players, even one in Australia. <laughs> and so he even, wow. you know, his idea was, you know, tell me where you like to go eat. Tell me what you like to do. I want to get to know you as a person. And when you have a coach like that, that, you know, cares about the person in the uniform as much as, you know, the performance, uh, you're, you're, you'll go through a brick wall for that that coach. And, you know, and I even had one athlete say, I'll go through a brick wall, patch up the brick wall and go through it again for my coach, (laughs) because, you know, I know my coach has, you know, my best interest in mind. And so, you know, I, I think that the relationship is really key. And I've seen that with teams as well, too, is, you know, they don't all have to be best friends, but kind of the more they get to know each other and, and the more it's like, yeah, it's us against everyone else. And, you know, they know each other off the field or off the pitch as well as on the pitch man, special stuff could happen at that point. Uh, I think that's definitely true. And, and as I look back uh, with all the teams that I've played with, the ones that are the closest, the ones that have performed the best were so well connected, you know? And yeah, you're right. Uh, I can even remember even in a well-connected team, there was actually a fight, straight fight on the on the field, on the pitch. Things were settled like that, you know? It was done and uh, the team had a lot of, a lot of success. Uh, I'm curious then with all of this knowledge and all of these things, you say you have an app. Is this, what is, what's going on there with that? Well, one of the things that I found is that, and, and you could definitely attest to that, uh, to this as well, is that, uh, we, we live very busy, distracted lives. And, uh, most of us don't have huge blocks of time. Uh, for, you know, it might be mental training or it might be some area, other area of our life. And so a lot of times athletes would tell me, and it's not just me, it's just someone in my role saying, you know, man, I wish I could put you in my pocket and take you with me to competition. Or I wish I could call you up, you know, uh, before I go to bed at night, just to kind of, 
you know, review what, you know, what happened today and get ready for tomorrow. And so what I thought in terms of, you know, in terms of scale, but then also just portability, man, I wonder if, um, you know, we could put something together for athletes that they could take with them. And everyone has a phone, everyone's on their phone. And a lot of that time that we spend on our phone isn't probably the best use of our time. Uh, a little bit of, you know, TikTok's okay. A little bit of social media is okay. But uh, it can be poison if we, if we take too much of it. And so uh, I put together an app. It's called uh, Champion's Mind. Um, and basically, it's two parts. Uh, one part is like a master class on sports psychology. And they're all little bite-sized audios. So uh, the master class is 12 modules. And so one module might be recovery from injury. Another module might be mental toughness. And for mental toughness, I like to talk about the four building blocks or confidence, concentration, composure, and commitment. Uh, another module is uh, thriving under pressure. Uh, and so there are a bunch of short audios you could listen to, you know, at the airport, uh, before you go to bed at night, you know, whenever you get a chance, maybe for, before practice. And then the second part of the app uh, is really cool because it's, uh, it's more about skill building. So, um, you know, there's visualization exercises, there's deep breathing exercises, there's relaxation exercises, you know, there's affirmations. And so you could just plug one of those on, listen to it for three or four minutes, and then boom, ready to go. And that's the key with mental training. It's not so much I need these huge blocks of time or I need to do it all in a day or a week or, you know, the, the first week, you know, before the season starts. It's I just need to do a little bit, but I need to do it a little bit every day. That's the ticket. Yeah. That incremental mindset is really everything because as athletes and uh, we get into the the cycle of thinking, well, you got to do it all. I got to do all the training. I'm going to get all the books or you're going to do it all at once. We all want to do that. But that slow incremental change towards the correct mindset or doing the right exercise will, I mean, that stuff is incredibly, it builds up. And you mentioned affirmations and uh, I'm curious on the writing aspect. I mean, some guys write their goals down, I'm sure. Some guys do not. Uh, I think I just saw a study, and I'm not entirely sure where I, I was listening to an audiobook uh, where they, I believe, separated a maybe a Harvard graduating class or an entry class. And at the beginning of their college, the, the students that had written their goals down, um, as opposed to the control who, didn't, who did nothing, I believe they earned more than all of the rest of Harvard grads combined. Something along these lines. It was just insane. Um, so would you suggest to guys, do you have a, do you have a, a, a thing that guys come to you and say, I, I want to achieve this goal? Do you, do you get them out right now in an affirmation? Do you have them right now, this will be what, what happens? Or, or do they write out their plan? How do you go about them having a step-by-step -step process for you know, getting where they're at right now to the actual championship or on the team or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that it's good to have small goals, medium goals and, and big goals and small goals could be, you know, more short term, medium could be maybe for the season and then long-term goals. What is your big picture goal? What is your dream goal? What do you most want to achieve? <clears throat> and, you know, I, I really love the idea of having scary big goals, you know, goals that make you kind of like, man, I don't know if I could do that, but I'm going to really find out, you know, how good I can be and, you know, and see what's possible. Um, I think one of the keys with goal setting is to ask yourself, what am I willing to sacrifice for my big picture goal? You know, what am I willing to give up? Because you can't have everything, you know, especially at once. Um, mm -hmm. And it needs to be, if you're going after big things in life, it really needs to be uh, a lifestyle. And so what am I willing to sacrifice? And I've had athletes say, you know what? I just, you know, I like to go out with friends, but, you know, I need to cut back on that. Or, you know, I love playing video games, but you know what? I need to take that time that I would play video games and use it for mental training. Uh, sure. You know, I, I need to maybe make, different changes in terms of my sleep schedule or my nutrition. 
But I, I think the big thing with goals, though, is that it, they should inspire you. They should be fun. They should be, you know, again, a little bit scary. Like, can I really do this? Uh, so that you feel like every day, you know, like, let's chip away at that big picture goal. You know, how can I get one day better every day as I get closer sure. to that big picture goal? Because that's fun. I think a lot of times when we think of goals, we think of like, you know, like kind of nerdy, uptight, you know, like, you know, stress, uh, yeah. you know, like these are things I should do or I have to do. Um, but to me, goal setting should be, you know, it should be something that that makes you smile. And that when you wake up in the morning, it's like, man, I'm, I'm coming at you. <laughs> you know, I'm going to I'm going to bring it today. Because I want to take one step closer to that big picture goal, whether it's being an All-American, whether it's being, you know, a professional, you know, soccer or football player, whether it's uh, getting into Harvard, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are my goals? And then what I always like to do in terms of talking about goal setting is commitment. And again, that's one of the four C's of mental toughness. And so for me, commitment is when the rubber really hits the road and you know, again, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to do to achieve that goal? And I'll ask athletes, uh, you know, it's a tough question, but I'll say on a one to 10 scale, how committed, you know, you told me you want to play and, you know, make the Olympics on a one to 10 scale, right. how committed are you, are you to really making that happen? And, you know, most of them immediately say 10 or nine. And I'll say, would your coach give you a nine or a 10? Would your teammates mm -hmm. give you a nine or a 10? Would the people that know you best give you a nine or 10? Yeah, and yeah. then that number kind of starts going down. <laughs> so <laughs> Truth bomb. Yeah. Total truth bomb. And so, you know, they'll say, well, what's a 10? And a 10 really is, you know, kind of like Armageddon. Like if the world was going to blow up, if you didn't achieve this goal, what would you do different? And a, a 10 is I would do everything exactly the same because mm. I'm both feet in. I'm doing everything within my power to be the best athlete I can be. And if it's a nine, you know, an eight, a seven, then what I challenge the athlete is I'll say, look, you just gave yourself an out. And, yeah. you know, champions don't give themselves an out. Don't be afraid to go for it. And I think what we're scared of is, man, if I really say I'm going to do this and I really put everything into it, what if it doesn't happen? And, you know, I, I think that if you're willing to do that, a lot of great things are going to happen. And you're going to have that peace of mind. I love the definition of success from John Wooden, the famous basketball coach, who just said, you know, mm. uh, success is peace of mind and knowing that you did the best that you were capable of doing. And I don't think anyone's ever regretted that. So to me, be a 10. Uh, doesn't mean that it's going to happen on your timetable necessarily. Doesn't mean it's going to happen exactly the way you want. But, you know, I guarantee you that a lot of great things are going to happen if you really get after it with everything you've got and really commit to doing it. And to me, uh, just starting out with anything, a commitment is really, you know, let's find out for the next six months how committed you are. And so if someone says, you know, I'm good, I, I think I need counseling. Okay, go for six months. Don't go once or mm -hmm. twice and then say it didn't help, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So six months is a minimum commitment. And just say, you know, I think that's a great challenge is just, for the next six months, let's find out how good I could get at my sport. Wow. And then I actually am, I'm going to go back to hone in on the question since we've gone off of it, but do you suggest people write their stuff down? Yeah. It, or? It, a lot of the research shows that um, writing your goals down and then sharing those goals with other people is, is a difference maker because number one, it's uh, you've kind of made it public. And so people could hold, you know, you don't want to be the guy that says, you know, Hey, what, you know, what's going on with your goals? Oh yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I forgot about Jesus. that. Um, uh, but, totally. uh, but yeah, that having people to hold you accountable, I think is really helpful. Uh, but everyone's different. And so the key is mm. to know that in general, writing your goals down and sharing them with others can, can be really powerful. And if you haven't tried it, it tried it before, try mm. it. Uh, but I've worked with a lot of athletes that it's funny. I remember one athlete, uh, a world-class uh, swimmer said to me, uh, I said to him, uh, what are your goals for this season? He's like, well, let me show you. And they were in his wallet, <laughs> you know, and, and again, he's someone that ended up accomplishing this, those goals, not surprisingly, whereas, you know, other athletes, it's like, well, I just want to get better. You know, like eh, <laughs> we, we might need to be a little more specific on what that looks like. 
Yeah. And I think to, to your point of worrying about if it's not going to happen, I think there's no reason even thinking about that. It's a little similar to what Michael Jordan said about the shot, about missing. Why would I think about that? Because the same, the same thing is that the time is going to pass regardless. And if at least you are um, doing and creating and pushing for your passion, you are at least enjoying yourself on that way. And that, that hope is there, that push is there, and you've given yourself a target. And I think it's way better than being aimless or like you said, hazy, which is, I think, a problem that I've noticed uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of the young guys that come to us. They say they want to be I want to be a professional soccer player or I want to be, you know, I want to play for Real Madrid or uh, whatever the the thing is. And they kind of say these things and it's not a true precise because a, well, like you said, when your commitment, if we asked them about their commitment, how come you're not on a team in your own city yet? Yeah. How come you're not training every day? How come you're not doing all this stuff? Do you, are you really, are you really trying to, to get there or, or not, you know? And so yeah, writing brings clarity. And I think that is a huge thing for, for everyone. And I, I can't say that I've written down every single one of my goals, but I can definitely say the goals that I've written down, even the ones that I haven't achieved yet, it makes it so much better, especially like on a day like today when I'm trying to figure out what to do, even planning my day just before, and then having two earthquakes in 24 hours, I feel much better knowing that I already looked at what was important in my day, what needed to get done, that way, I can't imagine what I would be like if I didn't have any guide, if I didn't sit down to reflect on my own thoughts and goals and really kind of put them on, on paper or at least clarify them in my head before bed or all that stuff. So I know that that is a, a wildly Im important thing. But yeah, a, uh, lot of athletes, getting, oh, hmm. a lot of athletes I work with will uh, put together a vision board. And so it's on their wall and uh, they're projecting their, you know, their goals and their dreams onto that board. So when they see it every day, you know, it might be as simple as, you know, how bad do you want it? The acronym and then the Olympic rings or, you know, it could be mm -hmm. a soccer ball. And then, you know, how bad do you want it? You know, like whatever, you know, your favorite team, whatever. But that's something that we need to look to each day and say, you know, am I going to am I going to you know, you got to look yourself in the eye and uh, am I going to really take one step closer to achieving that today? Um, so I think visual reminders are very powerful and be creative with oh. it, be creative with it. Uh, I, I think it was Michael Phelps that, um, Ian Thorpe was one of his biggest, uh, competitors, you know, biggest challengers. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, I, well, I love Michael Phelps. He was, uh, he was a reporter one time said, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, uh -huh. Ian Thorpe doesn't think that you could, you know, win eight gold medals or whatever. And he said, oh, tell me more about that. You know, he goes, he goes, <laughs> he goes, I love hearing stuff like that, you know, because, it, it, you know, again, the predator side of him is like, yeah, it's just, oh, you know, throw another log on the fire there. I love it. You know, but I think he put a picture of Ian Thorpe or another competitor on the ceiling above his bed so that every morning and every night he'd look, you know, am I getting an edge on that guy today? Mm hmm. I mean, yeah. Talk about <laughs> that guy. Another one of the predators. I mean, to do what he did also is is insane. I don't know what his trainer. He's one of those guys that had one of those crazy food things, if I remember correctly. He was one of the guys who was eating a massive amount of calories and and all that stuff. And and knowing that that is what it's going to take is also something that all everybody has to be aware of. Because when you when you set up to say, I don't know how many people are aware of what when they when they look at their goal. Do you know what cost you have to give up to truly get there? And are you willing to accept that? Because you can't go 25%, 25% of, of, of that and then turn around. There's no point in, in, in trying to become a champion in a, in a certain sense and only going 1% down the road. You haven't, you haven't even got the gold. And it's not necessarily in my mind that the gold is only the gold medal or the championship because by the time you get, you know, I've, I've played in places in different countries and I remember when I at least played in Denmark, uh, the director told me, I, I told him, oh, I should go back. There are a lot of foreigners on this team. And a lot of the foreigners are from Brazil and different pl places in Africa, and they didn't speak English. So they got a, a, an English tutor for them. And I came in and I said, I would like to learn Danish. And he said, why? We all speak English probably better than you guys do, which is the, 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 the truth in Scandinavia. I, I, I've played a lot of my career in Scandinavia. And for me, it was, 
obviously I wanted to do well with the team and obviously I wanted to do all that stuff, but I just thought if I can build this other skill set also that's there on the side that this journey, who knows what I can do. And fast forward all those years later, I'm talking on videos in, in Danish. It opens up so many doors and all this stuff. So oh. it's amazing what you can find on that journey. You know? I, I love what you just said there because yeah, I, I try to, you know, for myself, but obviously with the, with my clients, it's really try to broaden your horizons, you know, like, you know, Hey, maybe go to a museum every once in a while when you're on a road trip, you know, or, uh, you know, learn it, learn an instrument, you know, play some music or exactly what you're talking about. Learn another language. Um, when I worked for the San Francisco giants, a lot of the players in the organization are from places like Dominican Republic or Venezuela, right, yeah. or, you know, maybe a couple guys from Cuba, and I love talking with the Latin players because they love like learning new things and, you know, learning English and getting better mm -hmm. at it. And I love the American guys that were, you know, I call them crossover guys that would, hey, I want to learn Spanish. You know, yeah. if, if I'm going to be here and I, you know, I want to be a better teammate, but also, you know, this could only help me in my life by learning another language. Right. And so what that does paradoxically, too, is it kind of takes the pressure off your sport because you get, you know, kind of a way to you know, feel good about yourself or learn new things that are independent of your sport performance. Uh, but it also gives you a little bit of a break from just thinking about your sport. But that's a, that's such a key thing is what you're talking about is really what the most important thing is here is living a gold medal life. And uh, that's what we're all about. And, uh, you know, Tom Brady earlier this year said, uh, you know, I mean, he is just, you know, I mean, in his 40s playing lights out. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he said he never had a plan B. <laughs> you know, he's just like, you know, he's like, it's, you know, he just thought like, you know, I'm going to do everything in my power to see how good I can be. And eventually I'm going to be the starter. And he did that. And, you know, and then just took off. But he said, you know what, I never had a, a you know, a plan B. And because by giving it your all, there's going to be many plan A's. Oh, that's, that's very well said because I think that's, that's, it's it. And coincidentally, I think I feel like it was in Denmark. I think I was 23. Um, when I knew that this lifestyle of playing professional soccer was awesome because you get to go in the morning. I mean, when I look at it superficially, uh, if I had to choose my day as a guy who came out of school early and had to go to school, just like everybody else. And seeing people and my friends at a young age take jobs possibly that they didn't want to uh, for whatever reasons. And even some guys that are taking jobs, they don't have to, but I'm not sure that they evaluated what the best option would be. I knew I want this life. I want to be able to wake up in the morning, go outside and kick the ball around with my friends sometimes in the sun. And then afterwards you feed me and then I go home. And it's 1230 or one at the latest. It's like, that's what I, what I want. And so I knew back then, not knowing what exactly I was going to build, uh, fast forward, you know, maybe less than 10 years and uh, people are, they, they want to ask you, when are you going to retire? And when are you going to do all these things? Or what are you going to do after you retire? I guess is the question. And I'm like, the exact same thing I'm doing right now. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I've created this, this thing because after you leave the field, like you said, I can play video games. I can do this. But if you haven't realized, and that's something I, I, I have to thank my parents uh, for, is that I recognize that I was building a life. You're not building a career. Careers finish. But if you build a life, you're so set. You're so set. And you don't have to wait until after uh, you're done to start having that idea. And it can be within the field. So I know that that's true. And I, I get not having a plan B because I didn't have a plan B. I don't have a plan B. It should be all in on plan A and look at all the other plan A's, you know, um, because that's what's really going to give you enjoyment out of your life too, you know, uh, oh. rather than this tunnel vision. Yeah. The people so. you meet, the places you go, the, the, who you become in the process of trying to achieve those big picture goals is everything. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, take advantage of every opportunity you can to, to grow as a person. And that's, you know, talk about living a gold medal life is uh, famous psychologist Abraham Maslow. He was the first to talk about hierarchy of needs. And, you know, we're all trying to move up towards transcendence and uh, self-actualization. And he talked about, you know, in any given moment, we could take a step back into safety, you know, or comfort or a step forward into growth and, you know, and, and, and greatness. And so, 
most of us want to take a step back into safety. And the more you avoid, the more you avoid. And that's where we talk about, you know, we want to avoid pressure. Take a step toward pressure. Take a step toward growth. And who you become in that process is what it's all about. And yeah, it's priceless. And that's the thing. It's not so much, you know, whether or not you accomplish specific goals, it's who you become on the path to striving to accomplish those goals. And then as, as you get older too, is realize, you know, there's still so many possibilities, uh, you know, going back to Mike Tyson, I love when he was asked, you know, like, Hey, you're 54 years old now. Like, how are you able to even, you know, box at all? And uh, I love what he said. He said, I don't think of myself as an age. I think of myself as energy. And he said, if you're energy, you could be any age you want to be. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that. So as, as a player that's progressing throughout your career, you might need to make some adjustments um, and, you know, be a little bit, you know, more on top of obviously nutrition and sleep and, you know, other areas. But, uh, but think of yourself as energy and, and that that energy doesn't have an age. And you'd be surprised what you could still accomplish at any age. Uh, I think that's the key point there. And I think yeah, being obsessed about that, whatever the age, it's going to limit, it's a limiting factor. I mean, you're looking at uh, what does that age number really even truly mean to a certain extent? Because just because you're this age and someone else is, is that age, you guys aren't the same people. You haven't lived the same lives. What they could do at 20, maybe you couldn't do, maybe you can do that at, at 38. You know, it just, that's not really the the thing that should be what it, you're measuring yourself by. I love that though. Uh, the, the idea of thinking yourself as energy. I know that Mike Tyson also had a trainer who put into his mind at a very young age that he was this killer mentality, the predator, you know, he's the one that's taken it. You are the best. And, and he, he mentioned that that was there. And I think definitely when those things suck down into your subconscious, you've got, and it just becomes your, your, your normal state where you just, it just, you know, you just flick on. Well, and so it, I, that's so true. And a lot of times I'll, I might hear from an athlete or a coach that says, well, so-and-so didn't have a sports psychologist. Why do I need one? Or why do we need one? Well, they had someone, I, I would argue they had someone that was kind of like a sports psychologist. So uh, Mike Tyson, you know, his trainer, you know, it became like a father figure, but they talked about confidence. They talked about concentration. They talked about composure. They talked about commitment. Um, so he had sort of a sports psychologist, and actually a really good one. Um, Russell Wilson, you know, he talked about, you know, the quarterback for uh, Seattle Seahawks. He talked about his dad was kind of like a sports psychologist where his dad would say, you know, what are your goals? Are you visualizing accomplishing them? How's your self-talk? What are you saying to yourself? He would say, Russell, why not you? Why not now? And so we either have a, you know, a sports psychologist or we have someone, we need someone in our life that acts like a sports psychologist that could help us think like a champion. Because a lot of what we're talking about today isn't normal to think this way. Because again, what's normal is safety, comfort, kind of playing small in life because the brain is hardwired to keep us out of harm's way. And, uh, and that's why we all have a negativity bias. And that's why most of our thoughts are negative because we're always worried about what could go wrong. And that's for survival. So, but that's not going to lead necessarily to success. So I like where Nick Saban, you know, the football, the amazing football, American football coach for Alabama football, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, being a champion isn't normal. You can't think normal, you know, you got to think differently. And so a lot of what we're talking about here is stuff that, you know, some of the stuff we've already heard before, but are you actually doing it? Are you actually working on it? Are you actually using it to your advantage? And one of the things I love most about the mental game is that I might not have the fast twitch muscle fibers of Usain Bolt, or I might not have the wingspan of Michael Phelps, but there's nothing preventing me or you from thinking as well as them or better than them in terms of, you know, confidence and in terms of all these mental traits. And so that's why I like to say we don't, there's no such thing as a champion's mind gene. We could all learn to think like a champion to get the most out of whatever we do have. And if you can do that, you're going to like where you end up. Yeah. And that risk factor, and it's something that everyone looks at is, is, 
is it too risky for me to do this, to decide to be all in on, on this? And it just on the flip side, it is so much, it would be so much more a tragedy to not experience the potential that you have within you. That's the way I've always looked at it. It would just be terrible that if I told you, I mean, can you imagine if Michael Jordan told himself that he wasn't a good basketball player at some point, like what we would have lost, you know, the gifts uh, that the, all the things that he's done and inspired in people and stuff like that. So I think there's a general sense that we do. And it's, I, like you said, it's to keep us safe. We think that it's keeping us safe by denying this call we have to be greater, to be better, you know, to to achieve our potential. But you're not really safe. You're you're probably putting yourself in more danger <laughs> by not doing the things that are gonna e- express yourself and and you know make your situation and environment much much better. Well, so e- even with you, what you talked about is you know with earthquakes or with COVID or. Mm-hmm you know, life happens. And so this prepares us that the great thing I like about the mental game too, is it helps us on and off the pitch. And so uh, I've had so many athletes that say, man, like we were talking about earlier, I visualize, you know, for school or work, or I use self-talk all day long to get the best out of myself each day, whatever it is. And so these are life skills and we could all learn and grow from them. But life is, you know, life is going to, you know, adversity is going to strike. And um, and are you going to say, oh, no, or are you going to say, bring it, you know, bring it on? I, you know, I want to show what I'm made out of here. And uh, but at the end of the day, I think you're absolutely right. Safe isn't 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 something that safe or comfortable is overrated. And you at the end of the day or the end of your you know season or the end of your life you want to look back and go man i'm glad i did you don't want to look back and say i wish i had <laughs> yeah yeah which would, is a tragedy like i said and i've always been pushed towards that kind of i don't know if it was natural but it definitely my parents edged me towards yeah like you said why not you why can't you do this why can't you learn that language why can't you travel over here why can't you play and you know why can't you do all these things it's it it's so automatic. And I think it's important for people and players to hear, why not? You know, it's not that I, when I see uh, kids coming to me and saying that they want to play professionally or they want to play at certain clubs, I don't want to shoot them down, but I want to give them a real chance to say, all right, well, if that's the case, let's, let's figure out what we're doing here that can be better because everybody obviously knows whether it's in your life or on the field, you can do something better, you know? And so, in any case, all right, we've we've gone over. I don't know if you were if we were holding you even on that period of time or stuff like that. But this has been an unbelievable podcast. I think it'll be really interesting for everybody to hear all this it's stuff that they need. It's stuff that they've they've continually asked. What are your plans for things going forward? You haven't written a book in in a few years, if I'm correct. The app is out now. Do you got plans on stuff? And and where should guys check you out? What should they check out? Where do you want to send them? You know. Yep. So I have three books out. Uh, the first book was The Champion's Mind. Second book is The Champion's Comeback. And it's for dealing with not just injuries, but dealing with adversity. And so you might be down in a game, you might be, you know, someone making a comeback later in your career, things like that. Uh, and then the newest book is The Young Champion's Mind. And uh, that's, you know, geared more toward teenagers and 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 younger student athletes. Um and then with the app out, that's my main focus right now. Um, and we're getting a lot of teams, a lot of athletes using it and uh, getting a lot of great feedback on there that, you know, uh, uh, just a push of a button and I could work on my mental game and how fun that is. But um, and then in terms of connecting, uh, probably where I'm most on would be Twitter. And my uh, account is at Gold Metal Mind. And so gold medal, like, you know, let's win a gold medal mind. And, uh, and, you know, you can find me in other places too, uh, my website and all that stuff. But um, I love connecting with folks online. And, and uh, I, I love this topic because again, the goal is to feel instead of the safety part that we're talking about is to feel vitally involved in our lives and to feel energized. And that's why I love working with elite athletes and talking to you know, world-class people such as yourself, because it motivates me. It gets me excited. It's like, man, you know, let's, let's try to make something happen that other people don't think is possible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what motivates me too. You know, I, I have so many different things that I'd, I'd love to, you know, I, that I actually love to get after and I don't really 
hinder myself in pushing towards them. I kind of, uh, over the course of a period of time, have just kind of let myself go. You know, you just kind of, the, the thought comes in and you understand that it's a, it's not necessarily a truly just an egotistical thought of like, oh, he's won something. Should I win something too? You know, I know to separate from, from that and to see, I really would like to do this. And then once that happens and that you take that step and you just go. And I think that's probably one of the easiest ways to deal with it. I mean, all the, the ruminating over is this, could I, maybe, should I, if you just started, you would have already been this much down the road, but we will definitely, we'll throw up all the links to all that stuff. All the stuff will be in the show notes. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, then you already know it's right down in the description. If you're listening to this, come and watch it. Um, please check out everything Jim has. Thank you. This has been awesome. And I think guys are going to love this. So it'd be awesome to talk to you again whenever you're doing other stuff. So for sure. I appreciate it. Uh, love talking with you and thanks to everyone for watching or listening today. That's been a lot of fun and, you know, take advantage of this opportunity in your life, um, to be the best, you know, to be your gold medal self and, uh, learn about the mental game and use it to your advantage. And you'll be glad you did. Perfect words, guys. Go down, check it out, like this video, and check out all the stuff we have for you, and we will see you guys later. Peace.